For our scripture reading this morning, uh, I would ask you if you could turn in your Bible to John chapter, uh, chapter 6. John chapter 6, we'll be reading from verses 60 through to 71. And uh, if you don't have your Bible with you or a Bible app on your phone, it should be up on the screen behind me as well. But uh, why don't we stand as we read God's word together. And let's pray first as we do. Heavenly Father, today we thank you so much for all of our dads, whether they're with us or not. Uh, we thank you for their influence in our lives, and uh, God, I pray for those of us who are dads that we would try to model what a true good father is. And I pray that you would encourage and bless our fathers this day. In Jesus' name I pray. And uh, open our eyes now as we read your word once again. Amen. So John chapter 6, starting at verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray them. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus said to the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. And may God illuminate our hearts and our minds to the reading of his word and just uh, pray that God would bless Pastor Bruce as he comes to open up the scriptures to us. Please be seated. Thanks, Greg. Oh, it's like you could read Brenda's mind. Ah, you know, here we go. Um, you know, it's a wonderful day uh, to be in the house of the Lord every day, every Sunday. Uh, I'm thankful. So if any of you are new, I'm Pastor Bruce, the lead pastor here at the church. I probably should have introduced myself when I did the welcome and announcements, but, you know, I was all hyped up on Father's Day stuff, right? And the thing is, our theme today is hard words. Hard teaching. And we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about some of what that is not, as well as what that is today. Um, but before we get into that, I told you I would tell you about the shoes. So, like I said, Father's Day present, because my old blue shoes, which don't have any this yellow stuff on them, right? Um, they're getting pretty worn out. They got like duct tape in the back and stuff like that. So it was time, and, and Brenda found them on a deal, not at Costco, but, but she did find them on a deal. So um, that's, that's always the best way to give me a present is if, if it's a really cheap deal, and I, I appreciate it more. But the yellow stripes are pretty important. Because I don't know if you noticed the way I'm dressed today, but if we didn't have these yellow stripes, you'd be like, why is the pastor all black and blue? Okay, only dad joke I'm going to tell today, okay? <laughs> only one. That's it. That's, that's it. That was the one. But on a more serious note, before we dive into today's teaching, I want to bring a clarification about last week's teaching. Had a great little discussion with a brother after the service. Uh, with this great reminder about fear, because we did talk a lot about fear and not living in fear. And so 
In Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. Okay? Everybody in the world that threatens us ever. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Who's that? God. God. In fact, in fact, it's Jesus. Right? He's the one who judges the living and the dead. And we see at the end, he is the one that initiates judgment. So it's talking about Jesus. Then Jesus goes on to say, did I not do this right? Maybe I'm not doing it right. Sorry, guys. Anyways, um, maybe Maranatha, you, you can switch slides for me today. If we can go to the next one. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. We had nobody on for uh, Media Computer. And young Maranatha, one of our youth in the church, stepped up for this morning. But we need more team members. So it's not that hard to learn for most people. Uh, you can talk to me. You can talk to Walter or Brenda or anybody on the worship team. And we'll direct you to the right people to get you trained up. But grateful to Maranatha for stepping up. It's awesome when we get young people that are willing to serve the Lord. So, Jesus goes on to say, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God, right? Great. Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered? Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, why did I include this? Well, I included this because this is important. Jesus does not want his followers to fear. But it is important that we understand the fear of God. Here's why. Because we're still running around in our flesh and we're flawed and we have a tendency to sin. If you're at a place in your life where you've decided you're happy to stay in your sin have fear. That is not what Christ saved you for. So at that point, that fear is appropriate. That fear is appropriate. We don't play games with God. We confess our sin. We repent of our sin. We do so daily under the expectation that we are to keep a clean slate with the Lord. If you are resisting that, have some fear of the Lord. That's healthy. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Don't change your behavior, your obedience to the Lord, because of what the world says and threatens you with. Change it to become more like Jesus. Okay? So, there is a healthy fear of the Lord. And it should be a reminder for us about confessing our sin, repenting, seeking to live an obedient life like Christ. All right, let's go to the next slide, and we'll dig into our passage for today, which is the same one as last week. So it opens up with the disciples saying, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Now, the saying we're talking about was when a couple weeks ago we talked about Jesus saying, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, and this is very difficult for them. This is a hard saying. Now, what they don't mean is this is a harsh saying. Okay? There's a big difference. Hard meaning difficult to understand, difficult to grasp, not an easy thing for us. Harsh is different. Harsh comes from ourselves. Harsh is mean, cruel, right? Bullying, etc. That's harsh. Christ is not being harsh with his followers, but he is giving them something hard, something difficult. And you'll find as you go through the Bible time and time again, 
There will be hard things, difficult things. You will read things in the Bible that you don't like. That's true. The, the difficulty for us is just because we don't like sometimes what we read doesn't mean it isn't good and true and important for us to learn. You know, uh, I wasn't going to share this today, but it's, it's actually totally pertinent. Um, it is actually something Brody, my son, said to us a couple of weeks ago. This is what he said. If you stop reading the Bible for what it says to you and start reading the Bible for what it says about God, you will grow. And I believe that's very true. And it helps us with hard teaching. Because when we read hard sayings, hard teachings, and we're solely looking for something about me, we often are missing what it is telling us about God. So, instead, as we know, and we've talked about this recently, the crowd and the disciples here are grumbling. So it wasn't just the overall crowd that was grumbling. It is the disciples now, too. So these are the people that we would say should know better. Hmm, maybe sometimes it's like us. So Jesus says, do you take offense at this? Are you offended by the teaching? So, let's go to the next slide. He, he then talks about an interesting statement. What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? What he's saying is, you're offended at this saying? What if you were to see me in heaven on the throne in all of my glory? That's what he's saying. That would rock the very basis of their existence. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. We talked about that last week. The importance of the Spirit in all of this. The importance of understanding by the Spirit. That's why we didn't talk about hard teaching last week. Because you're not going to understand hard teaching unless the Spirit is helping you. So last week, we talked about the Spirit that helps you so that you can understand hard teaching and so that we aren't like the crowd or the disciples who are grumbling about the teaching. That's not who we are supposed to be. Instead, live by the Spirit. Hard teaching comes. What should we do? What's our response? We're going to talk about that. In, in a minute. What should our response be? Okay? So, then Jesus jumps in in the next verse, verse 64, uh, so we can keep going in the slides. Uh, there are some of you who do not believe. So, Jesus is making note here, and he does it twice in the passage, that there were people present who did not really believe. And who it was that would betray him, it says. So he's talking about Judas. Now, so there's the general sense, because at this point, the larger crowd of disciples is grumbling. So there's definitely an inference there that uh, those who did not believe, there's, there's a group, plural. But it's a singular, who would betray him. Okay? So he specifically also knows about Judas. It wasn't a secret from Jesus of what Judas was going to do. And, and I know Judas is a bit of a hard topic sometimes, especially, you know, there's a lot of different thinking in our world today. Uh, our, our world paints the pictures, the stories a little different, right? You turn on a movie or a television show, and there's a villain, and the villain's doing some pretty nasty stuff. But by the end of the show, you know, maybe they've caught them. Maybe they've stopped them. 
And then, of course, they explain that really they're just a victim too from some other circumstance in life that, that sort of turned them this way. That's not a biblical perspective. We, we are, of course, all of humanity is in one sense a victim, a victim of sin, a victim of the effects of Satan, right, in one sense. But when we camp out on that, we absolve responsibility. And that is not true. That is not true. Responsibility is responsibility, 100%. And the responsibility for sin, all sin, can only be absolved by Jesus Christ. Only. There's no other way. It doesn't matter how much of a victim we play. It doesn't matter the story we tell of, well, I only did all those things because of all these other effects in my life. No, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin is sin. The only answer is Jesus. So, these that don't believe and the one who would betray him, the only answer they can ever have is Jesus. There's not another one. There's not an extra dispensation of grace because, you know, Jesus knew that they wouldn't believe or that, that Judas would betray him. It doesn't work that way. Now, if Judas, it says he got remorseful. We aren't turning there today, but um, he got remorseful after he'd betrayed Jesus. Did he repent? It's possible. We don't know. We don't get that information. Uh, so I can't comment on whether Judas ever came to Christ fully and believed. Don't know. I know he felt remorseful. But you know what? We got a lot of people in the world that feel remorse. That's not an evidence of anything. So just saying all of that so you understand Judas is not a believer at this stage of things. Whether he ever becomes one, we don't know, but we'll find out in heaven. But what I do know is we do not see that he ever is. And this is not a surprise to Jesus. He was chosen as one of the twelve with Jesus knowing this. No surprises. So, in 65, next slide... This is why I told you. No one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. We've talked about this. We've talked about how uh, salvation, we believe, that's our role. We are to believe. But if you believe, you are to come to understand that it was actually all the work of God in your life, and it's all Him. He saves. He works in you. And I love the fact, and I'll mention it again, I'll mention it every week if I have to, that this gets reflected in our prayer life. We're praying for lost people, and we pray, Lord, work in them. Invade their life. Do whatever it takes that they would know you. We pray that way because we desire people to come to Christ and know Him. We want them to proclaim, I believe. And we're going to have the wonderful witness of watching people proclaim that publicly at the lake for baptism this summer. What a wonderful thing it is. But that's a gift of the Father. It's granted by the Father right? So, let's keep, we'll keep trucking through. We got a lot to cover. So, the next slide talks about that after Jesus had said this, verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So, they would have estimated that at this point, of course, there's the big crowd that was grumbling and unhappy with what Jesus had taught, but that there was a pool of disciples that were regularly walking with Jesus of more than a hundred at this point, and most of them leave. Now it's Jesus and the twelve. Jesus says, do you want to go away as well? Are you going to follow the crowd? Because what I'm saying isn't popular? Amen. Hasn't that been part 
of what happens to the church in our society, in our culture. We get sort of threatened that people will leave the church unless we stop teaching parts of the Bible. We get told, don't be so staunch on the gospel or people are going to leave the church. We get warnings from people who I would say probably are not saved. Because if your mindset is, let's sell out the word of the Lord in order to grow the church, you have him to answer to for that. And that is not us here. Uh, We endeavor to hold up God's word in its fullness. We do not want to go away as well. We need to be all in. So, what do the 12 say? Let's go to the next slide. Simon Peter, sort of the leader of the bunch, right? Lord, to whom shall we go? Who else? Who else? There's there's not another option. You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We don't have another option. It's, it's, not, it's not some buffet of world religions. Ah, this one's not working. I'll, I'll go up for another helping of this one. It's not a, a make your choice because all roads lead. No. No. It's Jesus and Him alone that saves. He is the only way. So when the hard teaching comes, when the difficult to understand happens... We are reminded. It's not because I understand them. It's not because I have super clarity in everything in the Bible. But it is because Christ, it is Him that we believe in. Him we have come to know as the Holy One of God. Him that holds the words of eternal life that we trust in, that we believe in. And as we learn... The Spirit works, and we grow in understanding. So let's go to the next slide, just to wrap up this particular section. So then Jesus says, didn't I choose you, the 12? So yeah, you know what? Jesus knew they weren't going to run away, (laughs) right? I chose you, the 12. Yeah, one of you is a devil. Speaking of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the betrayer, right? Now, To be fair to Judas, when you actually read uh, at the Last Supper and Judas goes out to betray, it actually says, and Satan entered into him. Okay? So now to be fair to Judas, it wasn't that he didn't have outside motivation, but outside motivation does not still excuse our sin or our lack of belief. So, Let's look at a couple of things to do with this hard words teaching. Uh, Next slide, Proverbs 27, verse 6. So understand that the wounds of a friend are faithful, right? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. What this is talking about is those who are truly in your corner, truly your friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, We're going to have words for one another sometimes that are difficult to hear. They might hurt, but that is far better than the one that has all nice flowery things to say to you all the time, and there is no substance. In fact, they are against your faith. Beware of that. Beware of that. It's out there. It's all around us. In fact, all you have to do is say to somebody that you're struggling with part of the teaching in God's Word, and that person is, maybe they're an agnostic or an atheist, a humanist, or whatever they are out there in the world, and they're going to be like, hey, it's okay. You don't have to believe all that stuff anyways. You're a, you're a good person. You, you don't need... That's kisses of the enemy. Understand, when you struggle, the evil one likes to send in those 
who would encourage you to give up the struggle. I'm talking not about the struggle with sin. I'm talking about the struggle with the teaching of God's Word. It's how we derail the faith in people, how we derail the church. It's not all because the evil one comes with harshness. No, no, he sends in sweetness. He sends in those that would give you all sorts of great words. It's one of the dangers we have with some very famous preachers. Next thing you know, they're surrounded by people that say wonderful, flowery things to them all the time when sometimes they need the wounds of a friend. Amen. Wounds of a friend are safe in our faith. Now, don't get me wrong. The context here is not because they are harsh. No. But because it is admonishment, correction. It is reminding of the teaching. And sometimes that does hurt. But not because it's harsh. We don't have room for harshness. And yet, we know we as humans are prone to it. It's one of the things we repent of. It's one of the things we confess. We are not to be harsh, right? We're to be loving. Love God, love one another. Very core, plain teaching of Christ, right? Amen. So, moving on. Philippians, next slide. What do we do? When you get hard teaching, here's what we do. Do not be anxious about anything. So first off, do not let even hard teaching from God's Word stress you out. Uh, you're going to read Revelation. If you find it gives you anxiety, you need to pray about that because it's not supposed to. There's something wrong in something else you've received in teaching. If you read any part of the Bible and you are already saved and it gives you anxiety. That's not supposed to be the way that it works. Now, if you're lost and it gives you anxiety, fair play. Maybe that's uh, the Lord stirring you up to understand you need Christ. That, that, that's fair anxiety. But to the saved, we are not supposed to read this and end up in an anxious state. Instead, what? Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We have what? Requests. We usually only use this passage with the idea of like having a prayer meeting. So don't be stressed about your gout. Uh, you know, bring it to the Lord in prayer. Right? Don't be, don't be stressed because a friend of yours has this or that going on in their life. But come to the Lord in prayer. This is not limited to physical circumstance. We are to apply this very broadly in life situations, including hard teaching. So what do we do with hard teaching? We go in prayer. We request that the Lord would give us understanding by the Holy Spirit. We give thanks that even in the areas of the Word that we struggle with, we recognize He is good and we can trust Him. We let our requests be made known. So in other words, it, don't beat yourself up. You're reading part of the Bible. It's hard. It's a struggle. You're trying to figure it out. Pray. Take it to the Lord. And even if you struggle still with the understanding, He's going to give you peace. That's what He does. He gives you peace that surpasses understanding. Peace. And it's part of how we guard our hearts and our minds in Christ. And when I say broadly apply, I mean it. You've got life situations going on. There's a problem with your parents. There's a problem with your kids. There's a problem with your grandkids. There's a problem with your neighbor. There's a problem at work. There's all sorts of situations you apply this. And you're reading God's Word, and you're struggling with it. Apply this. Apply this. Keep in mind... You're going to hear some Bible teachers and preachers, and you're going to hear a hard thing. 
always that should drive you back to the Word. Every time. Don't just take my words. This is the Word. Always back to it. Now, if in doing so, you're like, well, actually, yeah, Pastor Bruce's words check out. That, that is biblical. That is what the Word of God is teaching. But I struggle with it. I don't know what to do with it. It's hard for me. Pray. Pray. Other times, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that guy I've been watching on YouTube, he doesn't check out with the Bible. Oh, then stop watching them. Plain and simple. Oh, that book I was reading, it doesn't check out with the Bible. Stop reading it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everybody who preaches and teaches needs to do so perfectly, because I don't do it perfectly. But the minimum responsibility for each of us is go back to God's Word and know what it says and teaches. This is our foundation. That way, okay, if you still come to this church and you still hear me preach, and you know I'm flawed, you go back to God's Word and you sort out, well, is, is Pastor Bruce off enough for me to stop going there? Or is this, I can live with this, it's, it's, maybe I'll go talk to him. Yeah, that's actually what you do. You read and talk because this is, and again, I don't have it on the screen for you today, but this is where verses like iron sharpens iron come in. We actually need to hear from one another. I have not arrived, right? It's not, that's not how our faith works. And it's why we encourage all of you not to put any preacher, teacher, author of books, person with umpteen degrees, doesn't matter, on a pedestal. Don't do it because it's going to hurt you when they fall off the pedestal. Yes. Understand our faith is like this, not like this with people. There is one that we look up to in our faith. There is one that we follow and who flawlessly teaches in our faith, and it is Jesus. We follow Him and His Word. When I'm off, you should come talk to me about it. Now, if you only think I'm off because of what you've heard, been told, and otherwise, and you haven't gone to your Bible, I'm going to direct you to your Bible. Because that's the source. And, and I say this out of practical experience. Experienced some things when I was on missions in other countries of people coming because they didn't like what was preached, not just to me, but to others. But instead of going to God's Word, they're pulling all sorts of other stuff out of culture and out of this and that and the other thing. If you don't have it from God's Word, I don't need to hear it. If you think there's corrective action and it's based on... Uh, something you read or heard in some article someplace and it doesn't take you back to God's Word, don't put your trust in that. Get back to the Word every time. It is our source. And so, as you go through God's Word, remember to pray, just like every other hard situation in life. Ask God to give you understanding by the Holy Spirit. And for all of us who in Christ I read it some years ago when I was reading a bunch of Tozer's books and stuff, probably. But because I've got a group of guys going through Bible reading program together, and in one of the devotionals, th that was a quote. And the thing is that if we are not actively participating in the study of God's Word, we're missing out. Sure, there's reading. Reading is good, 
right? Like, to me, read, listen, all good. Go through the Bible multiple times a year. It's wonderful. I can't encourage it enough. But there's also an importance of study and dialogue with other believers around God's Word. And it is essential. Because that is where we get the reminders of how we apply it in our lives. Or else we're reading it and we're saying, yeah, that was neat. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah, I'm reminded that was, whew, really good. And then we just go through our day. But when we talk with other believers about what God's impressed on us from His Word, it helps us with the reminders of what do you do with it. It should change your life. Because God's Word is transformational. So understand, when you hit hard teaching, it might be one of the best things for you. Don't run from it. Embrace it. Embrace it. Not because you understand it, but because you're going to go to the one who gives you understanding. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may you grow us in the Spirit so that our understanding of your Word would continue to be refined and shaped, that our lives would more and more exhibit Jesus, His life, His teaching, His heart, His mind, that we would fully honor you with our lives not because we are perfect, but because you are perfect. And we thank you for the wonderful grace you give to us in forgiving our sin. We thank you that you are the one who does the work, and we are called to be obedient. And so we pray for courage and strength that we would become more and more obedient to you. And Lord, as we go today, as we go through the rest of this day, and I'm sure many have many plans uh, to do with dads and fathers and whatnot, I pray, Lord, that in the midst of it all, that there would be much grace, that those who have many hurts because of their dads, because of their fathers, those who have undergone abuse and challenges at the hands of a father. Lord, give them peace. Give them comfort. Help them that they would know the love of the true father who never abuses, who never mistreats, who never is harsh with his children. The one who embodies the greatest love for us. And so we thank you for being the great Father that you are. Help us to live honoring that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.